So today I want to talk to you about open educational resources and what the Sailor Academy has been doing is certainly a wonderful example of open educational resources. But I really want to talk about the fact that if you really dive down, open educational resources are about access, but they're also about quality and they're also about student success and retention. And we, um, we take all of those very seriously at UMUC. Uh, UMUC, for those of you who don't know, is uh, a large, predominantly adult-serving, predominantly online institution. We did start in 1947 to serve um, veteran students who were coming back from World War II because the traditional campuses did not want to offer courses at night and do some of the things that you need to do when you're teaching adults who have complex lives. Um, and so since then, we've you know, also branched out into a lot of civilian students as well. So we're about 50-50 at this point. But predominantly, this is a story about serving the needs of students. And I want to start with that because uh, people, are, you know, they often want to know how we did this, why we did this, et cetera. And we really try to start with the student, not what the institution needs, not what the faculty need, but what the student needs. And um, let me tell you what we did. So if you trace, if you know about the cost of textbooks, and I actually talked to a few people here who not only know about it because they work at an educational institution, but they're paying for their kids' textbooks now. If you have kids in college, right, you know these are very, very expensive. Now, a friend of mine last night, a good colleague, uh, we had a really good conversation about textbooks. So since we each have a little bit of extra time um, until they can find Wayne, I'm gonna, I'm gonna insert just a little, a little piece here. And that is that sometimes it sounds like I am just completely bashing publishers' textbooks. And uh, to some extent, at this moment in time, we are. But, so, so, however, if you look back into the 1950s and 60s, publishers really filled a need for us. Uh, as my colleague reminded me, that was the time when especially state institutions were really opening their doors after World War II. Classes were becoming bigger. Uh, those of you who went to state universities, you know, you had 500 students in introductory psychology. Faculty had a very hard time gathering all the material that they needed for this lo these large numbers of students, um, as well as the ancillary materials. So I'll give publishers uh, a lot of credit for helping our industry. I think in today's world, ed tech is sort of the, you know, the next example of that, where we have issues out in the world that we have to solve, and so we need vendors to help us. The problem is publishers became very strong and, and really worked with institutions at a time when knowledge itself was scarce, when it was difficult to access that knowledge, when there, there weren't a lot of alternatives out there, there was no Sailor Academy, uh, there were no OER repositories, there was no internet. And so it was really useful to have some vendors asking faculty to write these textbooks, gathering it all together, and then we would um, have students buy them. But it was also at a time when the textbooks, while they were never cheap, um, there was a period of time when they weren't that terribly expensive relative to the cost of an education. However, over time, the cost of textbooks has absolutely tracked at the same accelerated rate of change as the cost of tuition. Uh, it's probably not uh, an accident. And so we now know that many students can't afford tuition even at some public institutions that used to be you know, quite affordable. <coughs> And they can't afford to buy the textbooks. And I'm going to tell you more about that um, as we go on. Textbooks are a big business. And that's great if you're a textbook publisher. That's what you want to do. You want to sell textbooks. Nothing against that. Um, but there's been an 800% rise in the cost of textbooks over the past 30 years. 65% of students in many surveys 
have said that at some point they have not purchased a textbook because of the cost. 65%. We find that at UMUC, by the way, not 65%, but we know, because we've tracked it for many years, that probably between 30 and 40% of students actually, in, in many cases, never buy their textbooks. They try to sort of fake it, okay, because they can't afford it. Um, the average college student spends about $1,200 a year on textbooks. And if you look at, say, community colleges, and I think there's some folks here from the community college se sector, if you have scholarships and you know, financial aid for um, college, community college students, sometimes it'll cover tuition, et cetera, but it might not cover textbooks. There, many students in community colleges are actually paying more for textbooks than they have to pay for tuition. So there's something really changing here, and it's kind of going topsy-turvy, and um, it really needs to be addressed. So I want to tell you about a typical UMUC student uh, and why that model is not working well for our students anymore in terms of the typical publishers and textbooks. About 57% of our students are female. Um, most of our students are parents of children of some age. Uh, they are often first generation in college, and they are paying out of pocket or through a Pell Grant or through some form of tuition assistance or military uh, tuition assistance. Um, there are many military students in their families, and for the most part, these are enlisted military students who uh, they don't have a lot of extra money. You don't you don't enroll in the or enlist in the military to make a huge salary, and. So what I want to do is tell you, and somehow the picture got shifted, but I want to tell you a, a, two stories. One is about a diner, and one is a meeting in Vegas. And I figured the Vegas one would really, you're going to wonder about that. So one Saturday morning, I was having breakfast with my partner. We were sitting in Saturday morning, and we were listening to the people next to us talk to our, our waitress. And Clearly, they knew her. It looked like they had come into the diner, you know, like every week. And they were asking her about, well, what courses are you taking? And, and then they said, and what are you doing about your textbooks? So clearly, they had this is an ongoing conversation. And she started this long story about, well, the one textbook I think I can go without buying. And then the other textbook, two of my friends and I are going to buy a used version, and we're going to, like, you know, share it. There was this complex calculus of how she was going to get the resources that she needed. And my heart was starting to sink, because at first I thought, oh, I'm sure she's not one of our students. But then it was very close to where you know, my campus is, et cetera. So when she came back over to us, I said, Do you, I heard you talking to the folks in the next at the next table. Where, where do you go to school? And I was like praying for College Park, Towson. She's like, oh, I'm at UMUC. Oh my God, what are we doing to these students? And so we asked her about herself and she has two kids. She's a single mother. Actually, she had three kids, single mother, lives with her parents, works at this diner like for 12 hour shifts, shifts three or four days a week, especially over the weekend to make enough money during the week takes whole days off so that she can do her education. And so she has very little money left for books. And um, that hit me. And I went back and really started to talk to my folks about, you know, here's an example of one student of our 85,000. Can you imagine all of the wasted time and, and inefficient learning that is occurring because this is the reality of our students? A couple of months later, um, uh, a number of us were at a meeting called CCME in Las Vegas. It's for the military folks. And uh, we were talking about, UMUC also has our overseas contracts to teach students on base in, across Europe and across Asia. And you have to bid for those contracts. And the only thing that the contract gets you is that you can show up and teach, but the students, the military students are not guaranteed. You have to entice them. And so it used to be, of course, very easy to get a lot of students because in the days of face-to-face, -face, the students had no choices, but today they do. So military students could sign up for any number of online courses. 
They could go to Thomas Edison, as many of them do. There, there are fewer and fewer of them doing face-to-face. -face. So we always like to try to figure out ways to serve them better. And I said to my president, it's always dangerous, by the way, when you like pitch an idea to your president, because presidents love new things. Uh, and, and so I said, you know, I, I think we're at a point with open educational resources that we might be able to redesign all of our curricula, all of our programs with OERs, so that students have to pay nothing out of pocket. And he was like, can, can we really do that? And I said, well, I, let me go back and check it out. I think so. Before I knew it, it was a feature in our new contract. <laughs> and so we had to do it. That was actually really good with me, though, because I really wanted to do it. And once it's in a contract like that, you really can't say no. So uh, the solution was OERs. Now, OERs, if you don't know, but I would imagine most of you are. You're all the converted here. The, the Hewlett Foundation does a lot with this. These are, these are resources that are for teaching, learning, research. They're, every, they're full courses, just like the sailor courses, but they can also be cor just course materials, modules, textbooks, streaming videos, uh, tests, software. There's a range of these things. These are not just some you know, written sheets of paper um, or case studies. It's really, if you don't know what's out there, what is out there that's being developed and curated is pretty amazing. Um, and there's even more to come. So uh, there's five R's that you need to know about open educational resources. And this is what I think is so exciting. This is not just a walk through Wikipedia. OERs, you can make and own a copy. OK, that's, that's easy. You can use them and reuse them in a number of different ways. You can adapt, modify, and improve them. You can combine two or more, remix, rehash, and you can share it with others. And that's, I think many of us are, are focused on the, great, we can get to this because they're open and free, and then we don't charge our students. Now, of course, there's always a cost to redesigning and keeping them up to date, but we don't pass that on to our students. But it's the reuse, the revision, the remix, the mashing, the the changing, like any faculty member can take one of these OERs and change it to their, to, to feature whatever it is that they need, which is very different from, remember with textbooks, if you'd assign an, a textbook chapter, there was always that one chapter that you were like, I hate this chapter on the brain, but the rest of the book is okay, and so I just make do with this chapter. Uh, you don't have to do that now. You can actually change it if you have an OER. So. Um, you know, again, we had faculty, you know, accusing us of all sorts of things. A walk through Wikipedia. Um, this is, these are just cheap, low quality kinds of things. And none of that is true. So we made sure that we had our librarians who are experts at search of all kinds of materials identify as many of these OERs as we possibly could for various um, subject matter areas. And also our instructional designers followed a, a kind of rubric that the librarians created so that we found the right resources. And then we had, our, we had faculty teams curate them and link them to learning outcomes in our courses. Um, and, and then we embedded the OERs in the course. So each learning outcome now had X number of materials connected to it so that the students have their materials on day one they don't have to order a textbook. They don't have to go buy a textbook. They just get into the course. Um, and so between fall uh, of 2013 and fall of 2016, we either adopted, adapted, or developed OERs for over 1,000 courses. Uh, we impacted in the undergraduate school 67,000 students and in the grad school 18,000 students, and more, we have saved them out of pocket more than $19 million total. And that just keeps going up over the, the various years. It's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? Now that $19 million is if they all paid for brand new textbooks. So in reality, it's probably a little less, but it's still in the many millions of dollars that we're saving uh, our students from. And we won an award from the Open Education Consortium. Um, and this was, we didn't even apply for it. We were very excited to get this because as far as we know, we still believe we might be the, at least the only U.S. institution that has gone to all open educational resources. But we'd like to not be alone, so go back and try to get your folks to 
adopt that. Who else is using OERs? Well, it used to be that you could just say there's you know, three places. Now everybody, not everybody, but a lot of places, a lot of big name schools, um, Harvard has some OERs. Now, they're, they're not converted the entire curriculum, of course, but people are starting to adopt these, and there's excitement among librarians and certain groups of faculty. And I think you'll see more of this happening. Um, so, but people still ask me, do the students learn? How do you know that they're learning? Well, there was just a very large study. I have to update this because there's even a newer study. But the biggest study to date was in 2015, Fisher, Hilton, Robinson, and Wiley. And they found in a national study of over 1,000 students, and they compared students who were learning various topics uh, using OERs versus traditional textbooks that uh, relative to courses with the publisher textbooks, students using OERs uh, completed courses either at the same number, the same level, or even greater. So either the same or more positive. Their grades were the same or slightly higher, which is also what we found at UMUC. Um, they took more credits in the following semester, in the subsequent semester, and they had greater levels of passing courses. Now, we don't know for sure why, but you could speculate. If you have, many of our students live, they could be in Afghanistan. By the time they get their textbook, it could be a three or four weeks into an eight week course. And so they're going without the material for a very long period of time. The more you can get them the material right at the very beginning, the better for those students. And so better grades, they don't have to take so much money out of pocket so they can actually sign up for more courses. Um, I think you're gonna start seeing, because this, uh, this new study that came out, uh, learning outcomes are, are getting better because the material's right there. Um, so that is the story of what we did at UMUC, and I thank you for listening. And if you have any comments or would like to catch up, this is my uh, email address. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>